Allow me to take you back to the wonderful year of 2002. Europe's gone all mental and got their own shared currency, lads, lads, lads. Korn have just released Untouchables, an absolute banger of an album. Joaquin Phoenix is going full ham on a bunch of half-empty glasses of water that he told his annoying little niece to put in the sink. And 12 years from now, a very important entry into the Marvel Cinematic Universe will be released in cinemas across the globe. Somehow, one member of the WWE roster from 2002 will play a major role in this critically acclaimed superhero movie. And by the time of the film's release, he will have won multiple world titles and a achieved a high level of stardom as a squared circle icon. Now snap back to 2002 and imagine the look on your face when I tell you that said wrestler is currently the bald mute with the Backstreet Boys sleeveless suit that holds the collection box for Reverend Devon. It's an understatement to say that Dave Batista covered a lot of ground in a short space of time as a professional wrestler, ascending to the top of the WWE mountain in just a few quick years. His placid demeanor, chiseled physique, and peerless fury made him into a superhero many years before donning the scarified flesh of Drax the Destroyer. We here at Cultaholic were always more than happy to take a look at the life and career of Dave Batista, a gifted individual that overcame many difficulties in his younger life in order to achieve stardom in multiple forms of entertainment. I'm Sam from Cultaholic.com and these are 10 things you didn't know about Batista. Join us! Number 10, up to no good. Batista wouldn't be the first celebrity to have had a troubled youth, partaking in criminal activity to the point of ending up in jail at different times throughout his childhood. One particular offense that dotted Batista's teenage years was car theft, and we're not even talking his late teens either. By Batista's own account, he was as young as 12 or 13 years old when he began joyriding in cars that he stole. Think about what you were doing that age. I was being heavily bullied for listening to metal and enjoying skateboarding, and try to imagine yourself brazenly driving off in a car with some fellow delinquents. For Batista, his younger life was filled with permeating grimness and misery. He considers his father a stranger due to his perpetual absence, lived in poverty, and claimed that before he was even nine years old, three different murders occurred in his front yard. His gateway to putting all of that ugliness, including his own criminal activity behind him, would be turning to bodybuilding, a path that he credits for saving his life. Number 9. Discouraging Words By the time that Batista first appeared on WWE programming, WCW had already been laid to waste for more than a year. Other than sharing the ring with some WCW notables like Ric Flair, Chris Benoit, Booker T and others, you wouldn't necessarily associate Big Dave with WWE's greatest rival promotion. But in actuality, Batista tried to get his foot into the wrestling door by training at WCW's power plant. And to put it mildly, it didn't go too well at all. Batista claims that he was ran out of the facility by head training trainer Dwayne Bruce, better known for his time in the ring as Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker in WCW, or just The Sarge. Batista claimed that Bruce, who stood about 5'7 or 5'8, had a Napoleon complex, and worked Batista out until he threw up. Additionally, Batista even claimed that Bruce told him that he would never make it as a professional wrestler. In response, Bruce said that he told all trainees that as a way of testing their mental toughness, and adds that he doesn't specifically remember Batista's tryout. Number 8. Mixed Martial Animal Not even a month after leaving WWE in 2010, then 41-year-old Batista was embarking on somewhat of a surprising journey, that of fighting inside a cage of a specific shape. It didn't take very long at all for Batista to start training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under Caesar Gracie. He would only have one professional fight to his credit, a TKO victory over a man named Vince Lucero in Providence, Rhode Island in 2012, but that didn't stop Batista from further pursuing knowledge of the craft. After earning a blue belt in BJJ in 2011, he worked his way up to a purple belt shortly before his early 2014 return to WWE, advancing to that higher belt just days before his 45th birthday. At the time of his earning of the purple belt, Batista declared that he wanted to continue working until he earned a black belt. Even if he he never levels up again in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I'm pretty confident in saying that a man that possesses both his muscular physique and considerable knowledge of an effective martial art is somebody I'd never mess with, even if he is approaching middle age. Number 7. Different Paths In his time in Ohio Valley Wrestling, Batista found good use when Jim Cornette cast him as Leviathan, the demon of the deep, the right hand of Satan himself, and Big Dave more than looked the part. He mingled with a few WWE studs like Undertaker and Kane when they came to visit OVW, but Batista wouldn't wrestle in an official WWE show for the first time until May 14th, 2001, when he worked a dark match at a Raw taping. Just as an aside, you should really try and dig out the footage of Mega Company 
Men, Undertaker and Kane working OVW. It's just perplexing to see at every conceivable level. I mean, sure, OVW was a WWE feeder territory back then, but it's still odd. It's like, imagine Daniel Bryan just rocking up in NXT for a week. It's crazy. But anyway, back to the point. That night in Cincinnati, Big Leviathan scored a victory over Nick Dinsmore, a man that Evolution Batista would cross paths with three years later when Dinsmore was made over as one of the most offensive gimmicks in modern wrestling history, Eugene, the developmentally challenged nephew of Eric Bischoff that doubled as a wrestling savant. Reports from the match indicate that Leviathan was earning chants of Goldberg from the fans at the Riverfront Coliseum, which means that Batista was Ryback before Ryback was a thing, albeit with some gnarly contact lens action going on. Number 6. Baddest Grandpa Batista got a late start in professional wrestling, working his first match at 30, debuting on the main roster at 33, and capturing his first world title at 36. By the time he turned 40 in early 2009, Batista was already cemented as one of the top stars of his era, having taken part in two world title matches at WrestleMania and headlined numerous other pay-per-views. Also, before that age, Batista was something else besides a star wrestler. He was a grandfather. Now, there's a hard image to reconcile. Because when you think of grandfathers, you tend to think of kindly older men in high-waisted slacks that may or may not walk with a cane and are slightly hard of hearing. You don't exactly think of a muscle-bound professional wrestler that's about four years away from giving mixed martial arts a serious try. But sure enough, Batista had two grandsons in his life while deep into his eight-year WWE run, and that should dispel any stereotypes about what grandfathers tend to be, unless you've already seen Gran Torino, of course. Number five, standing tall. Batista's turn as the inhumanly strong Drax the Destroyer in Guardian of the galaxy and the wider Marvel Cinematic Universe has given him fame to millions of non-wrestling fans and has opened up a more prolific career in film for a man that had already made an indelible mark on the wrestling business. Guardians of the Galaxy was undoubtedly a breakthrough for Batista who is said to be immensely overjoyed at landing the role of Drax. But with that part came some challenges. To apply all the necessary makeup as well as the prosthetic tattoo pieces, 18 and all according to one source, Batista had to subject himself to a five-hour application process on a daily basis. Co-star Chris Pratt would note that for the entire process, he would have to remain standing, enduring up to five hours of intricate dress while on his feet, with only two guardrails to hold onto for support. The process would eventually be narrowed down to three hours, but it would also be followed up with 90 minutes of makeup removal, which is still quite a hefty amount of time. Meanwhile, all Bradley Cooper had to do was record lines for an angry raccoon. Number four, chosen to evolve. As far as wrestling breakthroughs go, getting to provide the silent muscle for evolution was undoubtedly a vital spot for Batista, as it positioned him alongside the ever-visible Triple H, wildly beloved Ric Flair, and hand-picked star of tomorrow, Randy Orton. Batista would improve immensely as an overall performer while aligning with the group, and his post-evolution launch as a single star went pretty swimmingly. Funny thing is, Batista wasn't even the initial choice for that role in the group. The first pick for the enforcer of the group was Mark Jindrak, who did film vignettes with Helmsley Flair and Orton in early 2003. Jindrak would later state in an interview that it was immaturity on his part that played a role in him losing the opportunity, and concedes that Batista was always the better fit for the spot. Hard to argue with that though, as it's difficult to imagine anybody except Batista styling those pinstripe suits and tinted sunglasses, offering dry threats in a manner that slowly swung fans in his direction. Number three, got you covered. Batista's fourth and final reign as world heavyweight champion came to an end on Monday 3rd, 2008, when he lost a steel cage match to Chris Jericho on the 800th episode of Monday Night Raw. The match was notable for one thing in particular, Batista bleeding, which occurred more than three months after WWE banned such actions as part of their move to a family and sponsor-friendly product. Jericho had an inkling that Batista was going to blade during the match, but advised him beforehand that it might not be wise to do so. And it wasn't. A furious Vince McMahon summoned Batista, Jericho, Dean Malenko, the match's producer, and referee Mike Chioda to a meeting, where they had to sit through video footage of Batista being caught cutting his own skin. McMahon chose to fine all four of the men, even though Malenko and Kyoda had no knowledge of what Batista was going to do. Big Dave was nailed for $100,000, while the other three each got off with just five grand as penance. According to Jericho, Batista calmly told he and the others after Vince left the room that he was paying their fines for them and there would be no argument about it. It cost Batista an extra 15 grand, but Jericho noted that it demonstrated the man's integrity. Number two, King of the World. 
When Batista won the World Heavyweight title from Triple H in the main event of WrestleMania 21, he would embark on a run that would see him positioned as the undisputed big dog of not only Raw, but SmackDown as well, following his drafting to the brand that summer. Batista would hold the gold until vacating it in January 2006 due to a triceps injury that would sideline him for six months. That nine-month run, though, that would be good enough to make Batista the longest reigning World Heavyweight Champion in the 11-year lifetime of the belt, as he held it for 282 days. Said reign topped the previous record holder, Triple H's 2002-2003 Mega Reign, by a mere two days, as the game stood atop the heap for 280 days clear. Batista joins Triple H as the only man to have held that belt for more than 500 combined days, as Batista sits at 507 through four reigns. Triple H, however, tops him with 616 days on five separate reigns. And number one, lucky number. In 2014, Batista became only the fifth man in WWE history to win multiple Royal Rumble matches, tossing out Roman Reigns in the infamous Deal With It Pittsburgh Rumble match. Nine years earlier, Batista flung John Cena out of the 2005 Rumble match, so Big Dave certainly has a history of throwing out future enemies of the Smart State in order to secure a WrestleMania title shot at an old Evolution teammate. Those aren't the only parallels you can draw here. Batista also used the same number in both Rumble matches, 28. Curiously, Batista was also the only individual in WWE history to have ever won a Royal Rumble match with the number 28, which is surprising given how deep it is in the possible draws. Batista also happened to draw 28 in his first Rumble match, the 2003 edition, which could qualify him for a Jim Carrey-esque horror movie about a mysterious book and an enigmatic number. But maybe he's better off just sticking to Marvel films. And that's our list. I've been Sam from Cultaholic. You can follow me on Twitter here. You can follow all of us at Cultaholic. If you like what we do here at Cultaholic, you can check us out on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And no matter what you do, don't ever forget to hit subscribe and join us.